With the help of Hashem, we are learning Yuma Daf Chav Gimel. We left off at the end of Chav Beis Amid Beis with the Gemara expl- saying that Shaul HaMelech was faulted for renouncing his honor. As a Yachid, as, a, as an individual person, there's nothing greater than being humble. But since he was a Melech Yisrael, so then he was faulted, as Chazal say, for him forgoing his COVID. We're going to continue with this theme. We're going to learn some words that initially are difficult to uh, actually uh, grasp. But we will actually see that there is a time that a person should not bear a grudge. Actually, not bearing a grudge is a mitzvah in the Torah, as we'll see. But there are times that a person should bear a grudge. And ultimately, the difference will be whether you are a private person, whether you are a public person, whether you represent Kedusha, whether a person is what's called in the Gemara Talmud Chachem. And even in such a case, when a person is asked for forgiveness, then a person must forgive. So we'll see about the importance of asking for forgiveness. We're going to go back to a detail of the pious, which is how they counted the fingers. The Mishnah spoke about one finger, about two fingers. We're going to go back to the avoida of Truma Sadeshin. The Mishnah spoke about a story that happened during the initial way of giving out the COVID of Truma Sadeshin. The foot race, how one coin pushed off the other coin and one broke his leg. We're going to see today a very tragic story. That really there was another story. A story in which Mamish one coin killed the other, murdered the other. And we're going to see how even during the times of Bayesheni, a vestige, a remnant of the, that, that which we learned not that long ago, that was man Bayesrishoin, there was a, a, a laxity, and there was a somehow, however it happened, bloodshed wasn't something so shocking. Some of that also went into Zman Bayesheni. So there was a, 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 a story behind the story that the Mishnah doesn't mention that we'll learn about. And on that Chav Gimel Amit Beis, we're going to begin speaking about the two steps. The Mishnah spoke about the step known as Trumas Hadeshen, the separation of the ashes. That's a mitzvah, that is a daily mitzvah. That's what we spoke about. How did they give it out? Ultimately, it was given out by a pious through a lottery. But now there is another mitzvah. That mitzvah is called Hoytzoas Hadeshen, the removing of the ashes to outside Yerushalayim. And we learn chitas, according to Rashi, and most Rishonim, that was not done every day. Fakert, we wanted to leave the ashes on the altar every day, pile up. We call that pile a tapuach. Part of the preparing of the ma'aracha was leaving the ashes, but in an organized way. But every now and then, we did need to remove all of the ashes to outside Yerushalayim. We're going to have the shita of Rabbi Eliezer that holds that a koyin who has a physical blemish, Pashgach Pratas, this is, this is what we're learning about in Pashas Emor. So normally we know that a koyin who's a balmum is allowed to do the deworming of the logs of wood that go on the Mizbeach. We're going to learn Rabbi Eliezer that holds that a koyin, even if he has a physical blemish, which disqualifies him for doing the regular Avoida, is allowed to do the Hoytzoa Sadeshin. So holds Rabbi Eliezer. We're going to have a Machlekes Amoyroyim, Reish Lakish, and Rabbi Echanon, whether Rabbi Eliezer will say the same regarding Truma Sadeshin. So one of these Amoyroyim will hold, that Rabbi Eliezer holds, that even a Balmum will be allowed to do the Truma Sadeshin, boiling down to, is Truma Sadeshin an Avoida, or is it a non avoida Linked to, do you have to wear the big day kahuna, all of the big day kahuna, all of the four big adam of a kain had it, or not? And a lot more. Chavra, let us start at the end of that Chav Beis, Ahmed Beis, Mamash, the last line. So, aside of the fact that we had a little bit earlier in the Ahmed a statement from Rabbi Yechanan in the name of Rabbi Shimon ben Yohid Sadak, but right above this statement, we had the Rabbi Yehuda Amar Shul that asked, Mepnei Ma, uh, I'm sorry, no, no, Rabbi Yechelen, in the name of Rabbi Shem Ben that, that we were speaking about uh, the importance of only having a communal leader if there is a problem with his pedigree. By the way, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu's mother and father was an aunt and a nephew. Dover HaMelech comes from a Moyabit woman, and yet there we know the Torah Shabal Peh, that Moyabi Veloi Moyavis, but you see throughout history that perhaps even the greatest of leaders, if you look to their background, 
through the Yichus, there's a question mark on it. And then we end at the end that Amr of Yehuda, Amr Rav, why was Shaul punished? And you can say he was punished because he didn't kill Agag. But you see that, no, there's something behind that. So, so, so to say, it wasn't fully his choice. Why did God bring that about? So the last statement we learned was, He renounced his honor. And as we read in the Rashi, that people ashamed him, people spoke negatively about him, and when Shaul succeeded in breaking the siege, people wanted to stand up for Shaul HaMelech's honor, right? And the last line in Rashi in the Amid, then Shaul HaMelech says, no, la yumas ish hayyim hazeh. Now normally this is a tremendous virtue, but don't forget that Shaul wasn't a private citizen, he was a Melech. So people that spoke negatively about him, people that degraded him, were degrading his office, and for that he needed to stand up. So based on that, A person who represents Torah is also no longer a private citizen. If he does not, I mean, these are very strong words, take revenge. Nakama. If he does not bear a grudge like a snake, Rashi writes that it is in the nature of the snake that they remember those who wronged the snake. And they bear it and they remember it. They bear a grudge. We'll see details. We learned this in Chumash Rashi. We'll see in the Gemara. The, dif the difference between revenge and a grudge. But if he doesn't do that, then ain't Talmud Chachem. That's not called a Talmud Chachem. I threat the Gemara. How can you say that? How can a Talmud Chacham violate negative commandments in the Torah? Well, if it says in Parshas Kedoshim, Loi Sikoim, right? Don't take revenge. Veloi Sitar, don't bear a grudge. Just the word Sitar, Nitira means to guard. Bearing a grudge is that you guard that in your heart. You don't let it go. Keep it within you. <clears throat> so answers the Gemara, listen. Hahu, where do we have this negative commandments? The prohibition is to take revenge, to bear a grudge, bimamain, when it comes to financial matters, who And indeed, these are the examples that are given in Torah Shabal Peh. What's the difference between revenge and bearing a grudge? He explains the Braisa. Nekima means, for example, Amar Loif Reuven tells Shimon, Hashileni Maglacha, please lend me your sickle, your instrument. And Amar Loi Lav, and Shimon says no. Lamachar the next day, Amar Loi Hu, Shimon now needs a favor from Reuven. And he, and he asks of him, Hashileni, lent, him, lent me Kardumcha, your hatchet. So Amar Loi, if Reuven says, Eini Mashilcha, I will not lend it to you. Kederech Shaloi, he shall tani the way you did not lend it to me. Tit for tat, you didn't help me, I'm not going to help you. That's called revenge. Zui Nikima, and that's called Nikama. Now, ma, remember, see that the example is a financial example. The Ezehi Netira, again, Netira means to guard. You're guarding the bad feeling. You're bearing a grudge. So, Amale, another example. That he shil ani kardumcha, Reuven, right? Shimon asks Reuven, Reuven, please lend to me your hatchet. And Amale, loy. No. Lamachar, Amale, hashileni chalukcha. So now the one who was refused the favor. He's being asked to lend a shirt. This is just an example. So Amaloi here, he'll tell him, Hey Lach, no, I'm going to give it to you. I won't be like you. That's called bearing a grudge. So he's actually doing something nice, but he's reminding his fellow that I am not like you. That's called Netira. That's called bearing a grudge. In other words, he's showing that the matter was not erased from his mind. He's holding on to it. So that's the answer of the Gemara. That when it comes to financial matters, we're not allowed to seek revenge. We're not allowed to bear a grudge. But what we are talking about, which was the case of Shaul HaMelech, which is the continuation of a Talmud Chacham, that if someone was, was verbally wronged, so there was some sort of personal suffering, or if someone was physically wronged, right? In these cases, Adaraba, bear a grudge. So the Gemara is not happy at Vitsara de Gufaloi. Are you telling me that there is no prohibition when there is a case of Tsara de Gufa? Tsara de Gufa can mean physically, Tsara de Gufa can mean verbally. Someone was humiliated. What the, in such a case, is there no love? Are we allowed to hold on to it? Vahatanya. 
Did we not learn that Hame'elavim ve'enam albim, those who suffer insult, but they don't uh, insult in response? You know, suffering insult is tzara de gufa. Shoimim cherpasan, those who hear their disgrace, ve'enam nashivin, but they don't reply. These are tremendous virtues that we speak about. Oh, and oisin be'ahava, those who serve God out of love, usimechin be'isurim, and they remain joyful even if they are suffering. About them, the Pasuk says that that for those who love Hashem, they will be like the sun in its full might. Mind you, the sun heard criticism from the moon. The moon told God, you can't have two kings wearing the same crown. The sun did not respond. And that's why the sun was not diminished. In other words, even if someone creates tzara de gufa by humiliating you, by verbally wronging you, or by physically hurting you, here also we have this virtue of not responding, which l'chayda means not to bear a grudge. So the Gemara says, let's clarify that. The one who got insulted, he, she, should not be the one doing the response. And that's a virtue. But, but, the nakat lay but they should remember what happened to them. Amazing. You know, so Shimi ben Gedo that cursed out David HaMelech, David HaMelech Taka did not do anything back to him. But before he passed away, he told his son Shlema, Vasisa And like Rashi says, coming back to Shol HaMelech, what would be, why would you hold it on in your heart? Why would you remember that someone wronged you? That if someone else wants to stand up for your honor, and they want to settle the account, don't stop them. That's the meaning of the Talmud Chachem, that has to be noikem v'noiter kenachesh, not himself. Not for his own honor, for the honor of the Torah. And that's exactly what Shaul HaMelech did not do. He taka let it go. Others wanted to stand up for his honor, and he did not allow them to do that. So he, she, the one who got insulted, should never respond. And that's a big virtue. But if, but there is an Indian, at least sometimes, for them to remember what happened to them and not to stop others. I, even that, the Ha'amar Rava didn't Rava say, Kol Hamaiver al right? Whoever completely, completely, Lachaita, relinquishes his measure of retribution, Takamoichel, let's go, Mavidun Layal Kol Peshav, God also will completely relinquish any type of retribution for this person's wrongdoing. So we see that there is an ingen of taka completely, you know, forgetting, forgiving, and forgetting. So here the Gemara differentiates, ah, that's only the mepaiso lei If the wrongdoer apologized to the Talmud Chacham, apologized here to the Melech, in such a case, that not only should he never um, insult in return, he should taka completely forgive and forget, and let it go, and not guard on to that. But if the wrongdoer never asked for forgiveness, even though the recipient should never be the one taking revenge, but there is an ingen of remembering it, not for themselves, for the covet of their title, for the covet of their office. And if someone else is going to stand up for their honor, they should not stop them. Sholem Melech stopped them. He was forgiving even if no one apologized. And for that, so to say, the, he was punished, and that's the ultimate punishment, that he was unworthy to have the kingship in, by him and by his family. You know, tremendous, that's a big compliment because he was such a great honor. He was so humble. But one who's holding that office cannot have that level of humility. Okay, let's go fight it. So the Mishnah says, Ultimately, even for Truma Sadeshan, there was a pious. So the Mishnah began to speak about the lottery. So as we mentioned, you had the Memuna al hapayosos. You had the coin that was appointed to be the administrator over these lotteries, would stand in the middle of all of the Kohanim that wanted to partake of, that wanted to have the um, potential option of doing the Avoidah. So the Kohanim, the wannabes, stood around in a circle, and the mamuna is in the center. Like we mentioned, these steps are not being mentioned here, but he would remove the hat, obviously, kohanim or yamulkas, but he removed the hat from a coin, and everyone stuck out, the Mishnah says, one or two fingers. The mamuna would say a number that's a very large number. You can have three kohanim, it would say number 60. 
And then he would start going and counting, but he, as we learned yesterday, you can never do a head count, so he would count the fingers. And the question is, why one or two fingers? Everyone should stick out one finger and count a finger. So says the Gemara, asks the Gemara, achas mi the wording is, if a coin can stick out one fi- two fingers, the Mishnah should say that every person can stick out up to two fingers. It will be self-understood that they, if they want, they can only stick out one. So Rabbi Chizda clarifies something very important. Omar Rabbi Chizda, loy kashim. Really, a coin should only be sticking out one finger. And that's by a healthy person. Khan, right, when the Mishnah says shtayim, that's b'choyla. Says Rashi, choyla doesn't mean he has a sick with a headache. Certain people have a difficulty just sticking out one finger. In other words, somehow their muscles and their hands, we have a doctor here, when they stick out one finger, the other one goes along with it. He can join the pious. If you, if you can't only stick out one, stick out two. But, as we'll see in a moment, what Rabbi Chizda is really saying, the memuna will only count both fingers as one. No, it's really, it's one person, one vote. One person, one count, one finger. But, and if you can't stick out one finger, you know, your hand is, is you know, the muscles don't function, well, say there, stick out two, but the coin is going to count you as one. You can't count the person, you count the finger. Uh, and the hotanya, that's benichosa, that achas moitzim, shtayin ein moitzim, ba'medavaramamurim, when the person is able, the body, your hands, your muscles are healthy. Avol b'choylem, you are unable to hold back the other fingers, afilu shtayim moitzim, and now the Brayse continues, <clears throat> there were times that the Koyhanim did not stand in that circle, for whatever reason. So the example would be here, again, a person is not feeling well, they can't stand properly, but they want to do the Avoidim. So it's not that if you can't stand in the circle, you're out of the lottery, they would sit on their side. They would sit at, outside the circle. They were called the Yechidim, the solitary ones. They also can stick out two fingers. We don't mind that they stick out two fingers. Really, you know, it's the goal is one person, one count, one number. If you're standing amongst many people, and people are packed together, then if you stick out two fingers, maybe the counter will mistake each one belonging to another person. He might count it as two. It's more problematic still if you're a chayla, okay, you can't do it, you can be joined the lottery. If someone, some coin who's joining, joining the lottery is not in the circle, no coin will confuse two fingers for two. He'll see it's coming from one person. So bachlal, it's not a problem if he sticks out two. But the ein mainu lahem elachas, like we said, really, even when someone stuck out two fingers, you only count one. Asks the gemara, the ein mainu lahem Indeed, is that correct? Do you only count even the coin who stuck out two fingers? Is the, the, the counter? The memuna will only count it as one number. But vahatanya, did we not learn in Abraisa two dinim? Din number one is ein moitzian loy shlish. Don't stick out your third finger. The third finger is what we call the middle finger. The coin was not allowed to stick out the middle finger. Why was the coin not allowed to stick on the middle finger? So Rashi writes, 12 lines from the top of the Amid, well, sometimes when we're coming to the end of the number, so the coin shadowed out 60, and he's going and he's counting the fingers. Now let's say Reuven, the coin s- s- senses that the, the number 60 will be the, the guy to his side. He'll be the, to the second to last one. So if he's at Amoi, if he's trying to trick the system, he'll stick out two fingers, He'll put it near his neighbor, hoping that the coin will mistake the first of his fingers as to the guy to his side. So his second finger will be number 60 for it to land on him. You understand? Well, it's he's really number 59. But if he sticks out two fingers, then it'll be 59 and 60. So in order to prevent that from happening, for the coin to take a C, that what? That it's one person, he cannot stick out the middle finger because two fingers, again, middle finger means l'choyda, that's the havamin here. The middle finger is a large finger, and, it, and, and you know, they'll stick out the middle finger, and we'll see in a moment, especially if it's the thumb, then it's going to look like it's very separated one from the other, and the coin might mistakenly count it as a separate individual. Likewise, never stick out the thumb, never stick out the thumb. The thumb is the finger through which you can, you can make an act of uh, Ramo'os the easiest, because it's mama's going in a different direction. Again, the counter will mistake in it two different people. However, says the Braise, but if he did stick out the middle finger, you will count. 
doesn't say whether you'll count them as one or as two, but that the kasha was, it sounded like you counted as two. But if you stick out the thumb, then ein moinen loy bachlal, he's not accounted. Not only won't he be counted as, he won't be counted at all. You'll remove him. And not only that, you'll give him malchus. For the fact that he put out his thumb. They warned the people, the thumb is how they would make this forgery of confusing the memuna, and the, the, the winner will be the wrong person. Mina Mamuna, you'll get flogged from the Mamuna. Bipokia, we'll see soon what Pokia means. Pokia is a certain type of whip. Now, so again, it sounds like that even though he should never stick out the middle finger, if he does stick out the middle finger with another finger, then each finger is counted separately. And we just stated above that one person, one number. Even if he stuck out two fingers. So the Gemara says no, the meaning in the second b'raisa is also that if he sticks out the middle finger, middle finger is not as confusing as the thumb. My mainim loinami achas. So the bottom line is, is that every coin is counted as one. So here he gave, here we have a good picture that if you stick out your thumb and your pinky, that's just an example, then they would take out that coin and give him malchus. Because when he sticks out these two fingers, again, the coin who's in the center will think it's from two different people. And, and that actually substantiates the principle that really one number per person. You can't do a head count, so you do a finger count. The shtayim is only for people that were unable to stick out one finger by themselves. My pokia, what's the meaning of a pokia? Amarav, Rav Taichus, pokia means madra. No yashikoyach. This happens often. So what's madra? Amarav Papa, madra means matrika de tayo, the whip of Arab merchants. What was unique about their whips? The Pasik Reishe, that the tip, the tip of the wick was severed. So it ended with various strands. It's a super whip. It hurts more. Now that he heard that the word here, Pokia, means a whip, now Abaya went back to Masech to Shkolem. It's amazing. See, another we spoke in the beginning, why does Yuma come after Shkolem? Here you see, no, no, this now clarified that which we learned in Shkolem. In Shkolem we learned about the 15 offices that we had in the Beis HaMikdash. And one of them was Hodetran, that Ben Beivoi was Memuna ala Pokia. Now when we learned Shkolem, how did we touch that? We said Pokia means a wick. We explained that the lamps of the Menorah had the, had the, uh, the keli, was a keli that can hold in it a half a loik. Why a half a loik? Because in this longest winter night, you needed the half a loik to have the menorah burning until the morning. But we also explained that in the summer, nights are much shorter. And it's not that they didn't fill up the lamp until the top. They did. And it's not that they allowed for the fires to burn into the day. It's not ideal. It's ideal for it to be consistent. Morning, the menorah should be, the oil should be consumed. So we touched over there, Pokia's wicks. And there was someone that was a wick expert. And he knew how many hours do we need this lamp to burn. And accordingly, he, wouldn't, he would not manipulate the oil. He would manipulate the wick. The thicker the wick, the more it eats up the oil. The quicker the oil goes. That's how we touched over there. And Abai said, that's taka how I learned. That I said, pokia means, I mean psilta. So there was an office that was in charge of the wicks of the menorah. And as, and, and, and Abai says, why did I say pokia means a wick? Because there is a Mishnah that uses the word pokia for a wick. It's a Mishnah in Sukkah. The Mishnah is speaking about what wicks did they use during the Simchas Beis Hasha Eva ceremony, where they had these golden bowls that were filled with oil and they would have to put them on fire. So it says over there in the Mishnah that they would take the wicks mibaloi from the worn out michnasayakoyanim pants of kayhanim that they're no longer going to wear and umehem yonayim and from their worn out belts and the Mishnah says the words mehen hoyu mafki in from it they would make wicks they would tear it into skinny you know strips ubehem hoyu madlikim and therefore Abaya when he learned shkalim when the when there was the office of ben beivoi who was in charge of the pokia, he understood that was the office in charge of the wicks. But now that he learned Yuma, Kivan, the Shomai no Leilo Hadatanyam, Veloyoid, that if a coin dares to even stick out his thumb, ooh, that's Aramoi. We see he's trying to mess up the numbers. He's cheating, he's a cheater. And not only do we take him out, but Shaloika, Min Hamamuna, Ba Pokia, we touch, he gets whipped, he gets, he gets uh, flogged. Here, Loika means flogging. So Pokia must, must mean a whip. Amina, that what was this Beivoi? What was the office? My Pokia and Shkolem. It means Nagdom. 
So there was a discipline office. There was an office that was in charge of whipping Kayhanim. Not only for this. You now we learned the Gevuda that they had, right? If you dared fall asleep, right? Remember we learned that? The guards, so they had the right to put your clothing on fire. That would wake you up. Oh, that's a Vekar. In Yeshiva, the worst case scenario, they throw water on you. The base of Migdash, they would put your clothing on fire. So there was an office that was in charge of discipline. And that was, the, that was and that's the meaning of Pokia. All right. Vaiter Maisen. We're going to learn a very tragic piece of Gemara. It, 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 you think after we'll learn this, we'll understand why Rebbe didn't even mention it. It's much, it breaks your heart. This is to me similar to the story in the Chumash that Lloyd, the big Machna Soirach, told uh, the people in Sodom, let my guests be with me. I have two daughters that are virgins. Do with them what you want. You know, it's, there's a certain confusion of values. Now, Hachna Sarchem is amazing. But on the Cheshbin, God forbid, of someone's children being uh, raped, who would even think of that? Serving God is the greatest thing in the world. Doing Trumas Hadashin is the greatest thing in the world. Even though, like we mentioned, it's maybe not even a full avoida. We'll learn this on Ahmed Beis. Even though it's only an avoida slayla. Even though it's, so to say, only a sur mirah. It's not a seitoiv, but we're serving the Eibushter. But for people to be so uh, strongly interested in doing one mitzvah on the cheshbin of a ben adam lachaveiroi, which is the weakness that many people have, and also vice versa. Some people are so into ben adam lachaveiroi, they forget about the ben adam lamakim. The extreme case will be over here. That in order to do the Avaidah of Truma Sadeshin, one Koyen murdered another on the Mizbeach. And Rebbe didn't even mention that. Rebbe mentioned someone pushing someone else out. We're going to see how that fits, like which one happened. So let's go. Says the Gemara, the Mishnah, right? The first medium sized line, Maisa, Shahoyu Shneim Shavim. This is before the pious. So then whoever comes first gets it. If two people came at the same time, foot race. And what happened was, one guy saw the other guy is going to win, he pushed him off the ramp and he broke his leg, which is taka terrible. So, listen to this. They both came at the same time. And therefore, what was the say there? Foot race. So Reuven realized that Shimon is about to hit the end line before him. He's about to come to the Arba Amas of the top, the Arba Amas, the six Amas, whichever one it is. Not a sakin, he took out a knife, the one who was about to lose, and he thrusted the knife in the heart of the of the Kayan that was about to win. And when that happened, Amman Rabbi Tzadik, Rabbi Tzadik stood up. We're al Maloi Su'ulam, on the steps of the Ulam. Now the Ulam Rashi says it's not the antechamber, but on the Harabayas there were many, there were many uh, halls. He stood up in a place that was very public. And he wanted everyone to know what happened. And he says, Achenu Beis Yisrael. He spoke to all of our brothers. See, there was a lack of brotherhood. Beis Yisrael. Shimu, listen. It says in Pasha Shoftim, right? The whole Pasha of Egla Rufa. If someone is found murdered, so what does a whole to do? And you have to take a measurement and you have to bring an atonement. So he asked, Who has to bring the Egla Rufa for this murder? Is it Al Ha'ir, because it happened in Yerushalayim? Or maybe it's connected to the Kaihanim? Maybe only the Kaihanim? Or Al Azoras means the Kaihanim. Now, really, as we'll see in Ahmed Beis, he was not asking a halachic question. There is no egg, there's no egg larufa in Yerushalayim. Egg larufa is only when you don't know who committed the murder. Here we knew who did the murder. He wanted everyone to understand that even if there's any type of bloodshed that we don't even know who did it, everyone is responsible for it. How can such a thing come? And indeed, he inspired people, go, kol ha'am And furthermore, that ba'aviv shaltinoik, Tinoik here means the coin who, who got stabbed in his heart. And he was a youngster. So his father came, umotso, and he saw that his son, he was still squirming. That means he was still living. So first of all, the father says, may his death be a kapara for, for, for the kaihanim or for Yerushalayim. But then he became aware of the fact that the knife if the knife will be inside his son's body after the son's passing, then the knife will become tummy. He didn't want for the knife to become tummy. That means that when he's seeing his son dying, what was he thinking about? Oh, tumantara. Here again, tumantara is the most important thing in the world. 
But in order for him to prevent Tum and Tara, what did he ask? That the knife should be taken out, which made him die even quicker. Vadayin, he says, but listen, my son is still alive. And therefore, there's no Tumas Meis yet. And the Gemara doesn't even speak out what happened. And he decided, the father, to remove the knife from his son. He didn't do it because the son was suffering. He wanted him to die quicker. Not, not that you're allowed to do that. He did that because he was concerned about Tumantada. Here again, Tumantada is the most important thing in the world. But you have to understand that here we're speaking about murder. So there was this confusion of values that in order to uphold the value of one thing, they were so lax or insensitive, Rahman and Litzlan, to murder. And Lalam de Chasha, Kosha, Lame, Tahara, Skalem, Yosem, Shvich, Zdamim, Oigevalt. And Vechein, Hu Oimer, this is all the Braisa. Now it's amazing that the Braisa is going to what happened with Man by Yisrishim. Because this happened with Man by Yisheni. Vechein, Hu Oimer, says the Braisa, Vegam, Dam, Naki, Shafach, Menasha, Harbim, Oid, that in the times of uh, by Yisrishim, Menasha committed terrible murder, bloodshed in Yerushalayim. Adash and Mili, Yes, Yerushalayim, Mi Poy, Lapoy. The whole Yerushalayim was filled of blood. Says the Marsha, why are we quoting Menasha? If I care to point out that even though we learned in Yuma, by Yishei was because of a lack of Avas Yisrael. By Yisrishim was because of the three big sins, including murder. But Kumtoy says the Marsha that the, some, some remnant of the insensitivity to bloodshed went through Zman by Yishei. And where did it express itself in this story? Now the Gemara wants to understand, listen, Rebbe doesn't have to write all of these terrible stories. But what the, what the Braisa wrote happened. What Rabbeinu HaKadosh wrote in the Mishnah also happened. There was a foot race. Someone was pushed off. Someone broke his leg. So the Gemara wants to know which story happened first. And we're coming to a very big question. The case of the Braisa. And, be, and obviously if that happened, then they must have enacted pious. No more foot race. So if it happened first, how did the story in the Mishnah even come to be? Oh, Elama, there was this story, and they didn't change the system. Even though murder was committed, they didn't institute the pious. So why would they institute it when someone only broke a leg? So maybe what happened first was the story of the Mishnah. But if our Mishnah story happened first, and the Mishnah writes that since someone broke the leg of the other, they already took out the whole foot racing, so then how did the story happen? So Arba Amois of our story that led to the murder, the first, the end of the Amid, the first wide line, four lines before the bottom. It says, The story of the Braisa happened first. But this is such a crazy story. This is such an exceptional, tragic story that we're not going to change the system because of one Koyans committing murder. The, they thought this is a random one, once, uh, a one-time occurrence. So they didn't react to the story by changing the system. But Kiv and the Chazi Afilu Memela, we saw that as a matter of uh, as a as, as a matter of course, Nachamol. Now one coin is pushing the other coin off. They saw no, this is not a one-time occurrence. This whole foot racing is not good. It's bringing people to danger. So the, 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 the drop in the bucket was the case of our Mishnah. But the big story was the story in the Braisa. So Takina Rabbanan Payasa. Now the Gemara is going back to the Braisa that Ahmad Rabbi Tzadik, he stood up Al Ma'alois Ulam on the steps of one of the Ulam Mois or one of the halls. Rashi says on Harabayas to make sure that everyone in the Beis Amikdash, many people in Kayhanim should hear him speak about what happened. And for Ahmad, and he said, Achenu Beis Yisrael, Shimu, listen. So he asked Anan Milohavi, who has to bring the Eglarufa for this murder? Is it on this on the people that live in the city? Or is it on the Azores, on the people, you know, do we look at the temple as a standalone state? So the Gemara says, what kind of question is that? Bechlal v'yirushalayim, basa suya eglar ufi, bechlal v'yirushalayim, bechlal is not included in the holding of eglar ufa. As we learned in Abraisa, that asara dvarim nemir v'yirushalayim, ten things were said regarding Yerushalayim, that it is different from all the other cities, right? And as we'll see, it's never subject to an eglar ufa. V'zu achas mihem davchav gemel amid beis, that eino meviyo, Egla Arufa. And like Rashi says, since in the end of Shoftim, in the parsh of Egla Arufa, it says that Ki Matzachal Badama Vigoymed Lirishta. And since the Ain Yerushalayim Yerusha, because this Tana holds, like we also just learned in Yuma, like the Shita that Yerushalayim Loinis Chalko Lishvatim, after David Amelach 
was Megale, that God's chosen city is Yerushalayim. So first of all, it's not subject to Egla Rufa. Furthermore, Ve'oi, the top line in the Amid, Le'noida mihi koksev. The whole passion of Egla Rufa is, you find someone that was murdered, and you don't know who did it. So now you go back, it's not that we don't know, case closed, no, you don't know who did it, the whole, the whole community is responsible. But that's if you don't know. But in our story, Ve'oi mihi ko. So the Gemara says, yeah, that not every time a person asks a question is the kavana to ask a halachic question. He knew all that. He wanted to evoke, he wanted to bring out people to a greater level of tshuva by acknowledging that there was an insensitivity to murder and it was cloaked with avoidas Hashem, which is a double problem. Says the Gemara Vait, it says in the Brai Sabo, Aviv Shaltino, I came the father of this youngster, and he found him still squirming. So, first of all, he said, But then he says, And the Gemara doesn't fear, and the knife was removed from him to save the knife from Tuma. So the Gemara wants to understand exactly where was their fault. Was it that Shvi Chazdamim Hudazol? Was it that their attitude towards bloodshed, right, became zol, became uh, not impo- they were in, they were desensitized. It's not that they exalted the importance of tum and tara. It was taka a direct lack, an insensitivity concerning bloodshed. Maybe it wasn't a lack of insensitivity towards murder. It's only that maybe Bisman by Yesheni, they were so cautious by Tahara Skalem. Abul Tahara Skalem, ooh, the Khamiri. Now, if the latter is true, then the story is not as tragic as, as the first option. But it was the first option. So, Tashama, me the Konos of La Talmuda. Since the Braisa brings a Pasik from Bayes Rishon, telling you, and that's the story of Menashe, the Gam, Dam, Noki, Shafach, Menashe, and by, in the times of Bayes Rishon, it had nothing to do with Tumantara. They were Bachlal. They were, there, was a, there was rampant murder. Now, tragically, we're learning this in the last moment of Golos here in America, on Tavshan Peyalov. There's murder the whole time. There's a tremendous, eh, we're living in a society, every day people get killed. You don't, it's not even news. They make their own news, whatever they focus on, whatever they want to focus on. This is what happened then. No, the problem was is that murder, bloodshed, was something that they did not take as serious as we must. Nor was then, you understand, they're, they're, they're masking their insensitivity to murder with the virtue of Tuma and Tara. Okay, enough of that, that's very tragic. Bottom line was is that they took away the whole foot racing and they instituted the system of pious and they had this... Uh, they, they were very careful. They had systems in place that won't allow people to cheat. Again, people that are cheating are saying, I'm cheating to do an avoida. No, you can't cheat to do an avoid. Okay, and now until the end of the Amid, we're going to learn, like we mentioned, whoever has a chumash, could die to open up a chumash. Um, we're going, I'm, I'm using the Gutnik chumash. I'm going to page 648. In other words, I'm using the, the Chamisha Chum I'm going to push it to the beginning of Parshish Tzav. Here we have two psukim, one right after the other. First Pasuk is speaking about the Trumas Hadeshen. Trumas Hadeshen means the separation of the ashes. That is what's done every day. That is the topic that we began the Patek with. And then there is another step that, was, that we did not speak about yet, but we're going to start talking about that now. That's called Hoytzoas Hadeshen, the removing of the ash to outside Yerushalayim. Now, the Pasik writes like this. So the Pasik begins reviewing details regarding the carbon oil. But now that we mentioned that the oil is burning right on the fire the whole night, Pasik Gimel, Pasik Gimel is through Masadesh and Volavash Akoyin, the coin will, will get dressed, will don. Midoi Vad, Midoi Rashi says, is his kutoinus. We'll see soon why it's called Midoi. But his kutoinus, his tunic is made out of bad. Bad means linen. And umichna say bad. And pants, right, breeches made out of linen. Mind you, the Pasik doesn't mention the other two begadim. Not the hat, nor the gartel. This is of tremendous significance. The Torah mentions two of the four garments. Yilbash al He should put it on his flesh. Al is completely superfluous, right? 
put on your breeches. Of course, it's on your flesh. We'll get to that soon. And guys, Pasigimel, the Hadim Esadeshin. Hadim, Truma, separation. Daily avoid. You separated from the pile one shovel full of ash. And the coin would go down and he would put it on that area to the east of the ramp. One of the miracles that we just learned about was is that that ashes, according to Toysus, according to one opinion, got absorbed in the ground. Yeah, this Pasik is not so important. The picture is not so related here. Now, Pasik Dalid, Ufashat as Begadav, he would take off his big day kahuna. He would put on other garments. Now, what are these other garments? Not clear. Are they big day kodesh? Are they big day choyl? And now, he would remove. This is a whole different thing. This is removing the entire tapua of ash. El michutz lamachne. Michutz lamachne is somewhere outside Yerushalayim. But el makim tod. That's the pasuk. Now, let's go. We learned in Abrais. When it says, Ufashad. The lavash begadem achirim. I just want to make it clear. You know, you know what the pasuk could have said? It could have said, "Ufashad es begadav, the lavash achirim." Ah, ufashad es begadav. Think about it. The lavash achirim. No, the lavash begadem achirim. And v'hoitzi es adeshen zok de brayim that shomaani. It sounds like the coin gadol. What he does on Yom Kippur. What does the coin Gadol do on Yom Kippur? The coin Gadol on Yom Kippur many times would change from the golden garments to only the linen garments, back to the golden garments. It was every time the Torah speaks about him changing clothing, he's changing into a different type of clothing. Linen and gold are different types. Now a coin Hedyet doesn't have two types of Big Day Kodesh. A coin Hedyet either has the four linen garments of the coin Hedyet. The other garments that the coin Hedyet has is his weekday clothing. So since the Torah is speaking about him un- getting undressed and getting dressed again, ufashat v'lavash. So just like by the coin gadol, it's to do different types. L'cha'oida says the Braisa here, two different types by the coin hediyet can only mean can only mean from big day kohuna to big day choil. Shepoishet big day kodesh v'lavash big day choil. Thus, you might have thought that whoever does the hoitzoa sadeshin. Not the Truma Sadeshin. The Hoitsoa Sadeshin will do it wearing mundane clothing. That's why Talmud Lamed of Fashir is Begodav. The Lavash Begodam Achedim. Again, like we mentioned, the words Begodam is extra. Makish Begodam Shalavish Begodam Shapoishet. To let you know that just like the garments that he wore by the Truma Sadeshin are garments of Kodesh. Just like by the separation of the ash, the Torah says, I know the Torah only spoke about two, but it's two of the big day kahuna. Hoitzoa sadeshen has to be also done with big day kahuna. Ma'la hala on big day kodesh. Truma sadeshen is done with big day kodesh, as we read in Pasig Gimel, right? Midei vada mechsen evad. Afkan, Pasig Dalit, Hoitzoa sadeshen is also big day kodesh. Ay, the imkein mat hamad loimer achedim. Why the word achedim? Is extra, right? Velavash. Why achedim? It's the same type. Ah, it's not exactly the same type. How is it different? Says the Tanakama, pechusin mehen. They are of inferior quality. An interesting concept. What's, they have to be the linen garments. But you know what? The big day kahuna, if they don't tear, even if they are worn out, they're still kosher to be used. But which kind would want to go with worn out clothing? So achedim means, not this picture. We're speaking about the coin hediyot, and by the way, this picture has the gartel of the coin hediyot with shatnes. That's a machloekas that we'll learn again in a moment. But coming back over here, that the coin needed to wear big day kahuna, but there were inferior types of big day kahuna. What right, you have your zaydin kapata on Shabbos, then you have your old kapata. It's like it's a big day. It's a big day Shabbos. So for the taking out of the ashes from Yerushalayim, which is an avoider that would make your garments dirty, the coin has to wear big day kahuna, but it may be, or maybe even better, it should be a big day kahuna of inferior quality. Maybe the linen was less expensive, maybe it was worn out, but it was still kosher begotten. Now, Rabbi Eliezer Oimer, another limit. Achedim, achedim doesn't mean other garments of lesser quality. Juxtapose the word achedim with the words vahoitzi. Achedim vahoitzi. Mamish chasidah shedrasha. Meaning that others 
Kohanim, that are not allowed to do the Avoida because they have a blemish. They are allowed to do Acherim v'hoitzi limeid that Allah Kohanim, even though they have Bali Mumin. And up until now, what everyone agrees to is that they didn't go home. When their Beis Av, when their Mishmar Beis Av came, they came to the Beis Amigdash, but they did secondary avoidus, like they dewormed the wood. And we also mentioned that therefore they were Zoycha in eating the, the meat of the Karbanois. They got a share of that. So now we're learning another thing that they are allowed to do. Even though they had a physical blemish, Shadim Lohoitzi Hadesh, and wow. So holds Rabbi Eliezer. Now the Tanakhama disagrees. Now let's 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 take this Braiso apart. It says the Gemara Omar Mar, the Master, the Tana taught us that the Tanakama holds Achedim, meaning Bechusin Mehem, Big Day Kahuna, but the Dafka had older Big Day Kahuna, inferior Big Day Kahuna that was used for the removing of the ashes, and this is similar to that which was taught in the Yeshiva of Rabbi Yishmol. The Tana Rabbi Yishmol, Begadim Shebishol Behem Kedel Rabbi, that when you have a, a, a servant who is cooking in the kitchen for his master, now when you cook. Your garments become soiled. The, the servant should not use the same clothing when he's going to serve the master. So that's the concept that any avoid in the Beis Amigdash that will make your garments soiled, be mindful of that. So I have another set of clothing, but they are big day kahuna. Now, that's the Tanakama. Now let's focus on Rabbi Eliezer, who explained Achedim v'hoitzi, a Balmum can do Hoytzoa Sadeshin. Says Reish Lakish that this Shita of Rabbi Eliezer is not only regarding Hoytzoa Sadeshin, Kim Achlaikis Bohitzoa. Machlaikis is because the Tanakhama does not agree with Rabbi Eliezer. The Tanakhama does not allow a Koyan Balmum to do the Hoytzoa Sadeshin. Rabbi Eliezer does. Says Reish Lakish, he also, Kach Machlaikis Baharama, even Truma Sadeshin. Daily Avoidim, the Avoidim that we began the Pedic with, the Avoidim which they used to have a foot race for, even that may be done with a coin who has a blemish. We're speaking about physical blemishes, Parshas Emoid, that disqualifies a coin of doing the direct Avoidim. However, Rabbi Yechanan says no. He says the Machlekes is only Behoit However, Abel Baharama, no, Divriyakol Avoidihi. And since it's called an Avoidah, obviously a Balmum may not partake in it. Now, my Tamadir Eshlakish. Who holds that true masadeshin is not called an avoida? Omar Lach Resh Lakish says, "Is al kadai techavoidihi." The Torah we read the pasuk in Parshas Gimel only spoke about the lava shakoyin midayvad umichnasayvad. He put on a tunic of linen and breeches of linen. What about the hat? What about the gartel? Resh Lakish understands that Hitaka only wore those two garments. Now, if true masadeshin is a bona fide avoida, says Resh Lakish. To Kalim, Kalim here means begotten. Truma Sadashin is also a non avoida which is why Rabbi Eliezer will hold a Balmum can do it as well. However, Rabbi Yechanan says the Torah only mentioned two, but that's Megala that he needed to wear all four. Goli Rachmano Bikutainus and Mechnasayim. But once the Torah says he has to wear the tunic, he has to wear the breeches, that's Megala, who had the limit snafes vavnit. I, why, let Rabbi Yechenon, does the Torah only specify these two? To tell you other details about these two. Number one, it says, Midoi Vad. Midoi is one of the words that are used for the kutainus, for the tunic. But why do we change its expression? So says Rabbi Yechenon, the Torah says, Midoi. Midoi can also mean mida, measurement. It has to fit his measurement. Guys, we learned this in Zvachim. We learned in Zvachim the importance of wearing a long kapat on Shabbos, not to wear the mini skirt kapatas. Because midoy of the koyin is it has to go all the way down to his ankles. It cannot drag on the floor, shlumpy, but it cannot be too high up suspended from the ground. It needed to be measured. How do you know that? The first of the four begadim have to be the breeches. Nothing should be put on before the breeches because it says here, Omichna Seivad Yilbash Al Besorai. The word Al Besorai is extra. It should say, Michna Seivad Yilbash. Al Besorai means that when he's completely unclothed, it's only his basar. The first thing on Besorai is Michna Seivad. Resh Lakish will hold. Midoi Resh Lakish holds that it's only these two garments. Now, Reish Lakish also agrees 
that the tunic needed to be properly measured for the height of the coin. But he can learn two things. He says the fact that the Torah says midoi will teach you also the din of kim midosoi mida afke rachmano baloshin midoi. Normally the Torah uses the word kutainus. Here the Torah deviates from the kutainus and he uses the words midoi. So it also teaches you that. Similarly, shaloi yehidavar koydam lamechosayim. I also I agree that we learn it from the extra words al besaray. But the point of reshlakish is is that these two garments were the only two garments worn. Which means it's not an avoida, and therefore Rabbi Eliezer will hold that a balmum is allowed to do trumas adeshen as well. Okay, so basically we have over here machlekes tanoim, whether machlekes amoyroim, Rabbi Yechonon Reish Lakish, whether trumas adeshen is called an avoida. Says the Gemara, name it. Perhaps it's really a machlekes tanoim, whether trumas adeshen is considered a avoida or not. And what's the b'raisa? The b'raisa is focusing on the words here. Al besoroi. Here the b'raisa is not saying that al besoroi is extra. The b'raisa is saying it would have been enough to say umichne seibad al besoroi. Umichne seibad al would have been enough. The al besoroi is to tell you that the breaches has to come first. But mat hamadloimir yilbash. The word yilbash is extra. So says that Rabbi Yehuda lahavi mitznefes va'avneit laharama fakert yilbash. Is to teach you, mamish, the way we had in Rabbi Yechanan. The moment you say Yilbash, Yilbash means all the four big other. So it's being Maramez, the other two garments. Mamish Rabbi Yechanan. Rabbi Doisa says that Yilbash is a whole different din. Yilbash, le Rabbi is big day kain God, but Yom Akipurim, Shekshedim, le kain Hediot. No, it's really le that comes out, le that comes out, that Rabbi Doisa holds, he only wears two. It's not an avoid. I versus Yilbash. So here he has like this Gezeda Shavah Yilbash Yilbash to tell you that as we, we, we just learned this recently that even though it says an Achrim Ois Vihi Nicham Sham and some Tanoim understand Vihi Nicham Sham means that after the coin God did his avoid with the big day uh, bad with the linen garments he leaves it there for it never to be used says Rabbi Daisa no, the, uh, no, no Vihi Nicham Sham only means that the same coin God cannot use it again next year it's also a Chiddush. But Yilbash is to tell you that a Koyen Hedyit is allowed to wear the big day of the Koyen Gadol that he wore on Yom Kippur. So said Rab Doisa. And Rebbe, without getting into the Yilbash of the Truma Sadeshen, he rejects this statement of Rab Doisa, that a Koyen Hedyit is allowed to wear the big Godem of a Koyen Gadol, that the Koyen Gadol wore when he went in Lefnai Velefnim. Amar Rebbe, shtei tshuva is bedover. A tshuva here doesn't mean a tshuva. A tshuva means a kasha. I have two refutations for you. Number one, it's, it can't even be. Because Rebbe holds that the gartel of a coin had yet was made out of shotness. And everyone holds that the avnait that the coin gadol wore when he went lifnaiva lifnim was only made out of linen. So it's not even the same garment. Number one, avnait shall coin gadol loyzeh who avnait shall coin had yet. Remember, that was one of the proofs that the Rebbe is the one that holds that the coin had yet, that's the picture, war shotness. That's how it went. Oh, number, and number two, how can it be that garments, says Rebbe, it was used to go into the Holy of Holies, can be. Again, we're back here in Parsha Sav, that's something else. That's Lanabis Es Hashachim. Yilbash means that even if the garments are worn out, Bechlal, the garments are worn out, it's taka of inferior quality, but they are allowed to be used. Torn, patched, may never be used. Worn out is fine. And now let's go over here. So it, it, all of this is really connected to how do you touch the words V'hinicham sham in achrimois. So V'hinicham sham elameid, that's all Rebbe, indeed to unam geniza, that whenever the Kohen Gadol walked out of the Kaddish HaKadoshim, when he finishes doing the Avodah Yom Kippur, those garments were never used by anyone ever again. It was, it was you were going as it. Harab doisa oimer, no. That the same that the coin god should never use it again on Yom Kippur. Okay, this detail is not negated to our Tanoi. The point is, my love The Mar Sova Rabbi Yehuda and Abdoi said Rabbi Yehuda holds that it's an avoid, and therefore Yilbash, as he says, Yilbash is needed to teach you that the coin had yet would wear. All of the four begadim for Truma Sadesh. And why do you have to wear the four begadim? Because removing of the ashes is called an avoid. 
Umar Sovar, Rabdoi so holds that it's not an avoido. So Yilbash is now needed to teach you his novelty that a coin head yet is allowed to wear the big day kahuna gedoyla that he wore on Yom Kippur. So that's a machlekes tanoim. So says the Gemara. By the way, this whole thing is very interesting. It's in Truma Sadeshin, is speaking about removing something negative. Is that an avoida proper or is that a pre avoida? It's a very significant machlekes. So the Gemara says, Loi the kula alma. Everyone will hold side of Yehuda, side of Doisa. This is all that Rabbi Yechanan is saying. We'll hold that it's an avoida, and you have to wear the arba begadim. And coming back to our sugya, no one will hold that a coin balmum can do it. The only question is, do you even need a yilbash to teach you that? Mar Sovar Rabbi Yehuda holds that you take and need the pasik to include the hat and the belt. You need that yilbash. Rabbi Doisa holds, it's such a vadai that a coin head it can only do Trumas Adesh and wearing the four begadim. You don't even need the yilbash to teach you he has to wear the hat and the belt. So Rabbi Doisa has now the yilbash as, a, as an extra word that he uses to teach you his chiddish, that a coin had yet, gets to wear the begadim that the coin god will wear when he went lefnai velefnim. And Rabbi Yehuda holds, this is very important, no, he doesn't, he doesn't have that gilbash open. So Rabbi Yehuda holds a coin had yet, cannot wear the big day kahuna gedoyla. I want to say something interesting. Bechlal, we have a rule. Whenever the Gemara speaks about maise b'chased echad, you know who that chased is? It's Rabbi Yehuda Rabbi Loi, Rabbi Yehuda. This is Rabbi Yehuda over here. And this concept of can a Kohen head yet wear the garments of the Kohen Gadol? That's the whole machloikas that the Alter Rebbe had with his colleagues. In other words, what's the function of a Rebbe? Can a Chassid wear the garments of the Rebbe? Can we grab on to the Gartel of our Rebbe and, 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 and elevate ourselves? So interestingly, the Chassid Echad, Rabbi Yehuda, he holds like the Chabad Hasidus that absolutely not. That you coin head yet, that we have to do our own avoida. And if the coin gadol obviously is on a much higher madrega, well, that's the avoida of the coin gadol. I have to climb up the ladder by myself. But the sheet of Rabdoisa holds is that a chassid is able, so to say, to wear the garments of the Rebbe. All we need to do is to be connected to the Rebbe, and that in itself will elevate the chassid. Chavra to be continued.